screen. Can you see my screen? Good. Good. I got a nod. Okay, great. So a uh, little bit of background on me. I'm Adam Walker. I'm known for wearing hats and having a million children. Here is a picture of most of the children right now. So I'm a husband, father of five, almost six. We're in the process of adopting uh, an additional child from China. You can see in the picture there, we got one little guy from China several years back. And now we're in the process of actually adopting his foster brother, who is 11 and currently uh, in China. So we're excited about that. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm the co-founder of 48 and 48, which is a nonprofit that builds 48 free marketing websites uh, for other nonprofits in 48 hours. So if you're a nonprofit that needs a website, check out 48and48.org. Um, also, I'm actually now not at Dragon Army. I'm now the CMO at TechBridge, which is a technology nonprofit that helps other nonprofits grow through the use of technology. So um, there'll be more links at the end, links back to my website. Happy to connect with any of you. I also host several podcasts. If you really like my voice, this is a good opportunity to hear a lot more of it. In particular, Tech Talk Y'all is a really fun podcast that I co-host with the inventor of IP geolocation. So if you really like getting ads based on where you're located, you can thank him. Um, but that's it. Uh, also, my background in marketing might be helpful. I, I did co-found an agency. We ran for, it was a digital agency, we ran for 10 years and then we were acquired by a larger agency called Dragon Army. So got a lot of experience in the space, a lot of experience with nonprofits and uh, really enjoy helping nonprofits with marketing and technology. So let's start with this. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55, min 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. That's a quote from Albert Einstein. And the reason that I'm giving you this quote is because I find that a lot of nonprofits spend a lot of time on solutions and a lot of time on implementations when it, becomes, when it comes to marketing, but not a lot of time really thinking about what they're doing or why they're doing it. And so what I find is that there's a lot of marketing that happens that really does not help and does not move the needle because there wasn't proper thought giving it, given to it in the first place. So that's where I'd like to start is giving us a context by which we can think about marketing so that we can be more strategic and thoughtful in how we do it. So I like to describe marketing as like it's creating a train route. So the first thing you wanna do is create a story and that is the actual route. Um, where are you taking people? Or, or is the train gonna go from Atlanta where I am to New York City? Uh, is it gonna go somewhere else? Is it gonna go to Vancouver? Where's the train going to go? What, where, are you, where are you taking people with your story? Um, why does your organization exist? That should be a key part of your narrative. If there's any Simon Sinek fans in the audience, you'll know why I'm saying that. The next part is your strategy. So that's, that's actually building the train. That's the thing that is going to take people where you want them to go on your journey. So why are you marketing? Who are you marketing to? What do you want people to do? These are, these are very basic questions, but I find that a lot of companies and a lot of nonprofits are unable to answer the questions. Why are, you know, one of the things that I've implemented since I became CMO at TechBridge is when somebody requests something for marketing, my first question is, okay, why are we doing this? And they need to be able to give me an answer. Why are we doing this? The next thing is structure. So you've got to actually build the train. So we just designed the train, that strategy. Now you have to build the train. Um, that's answering questions like what marketing channels are you going to use? What content are you going to create? How often are you going to create it? How do you want to think about content? How are you going to share it out? Are you going to create a blog post and then share it out just on Facebook? Or are you going to use Facebook and LinkedIn? So thinking about what is the structure that you need to use for your marketing execution? And then that is the last piece, which is execution. So that's actually laying the tracks, building the team, finding the tools that you need, and actually moving forward with your marketing to take people to where you want them to go. So, but first thing first, take people where you want them to go. Also, I forgot to mention this at the opening of our webinar, but if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A inside of Zoom to ask questions. I will be monitoring throughout the presentation. And at the end, there will be a lot of time for us to talk, uh, do a lot of Q&A, and I'm happy to answer questions about websites, social media, uh, strategy, tactics, whatever's helpful to you, I'm happy to do. So my next recommendation is do less. So again, I find that a lot of organizations, a lot of nonprofits tend to try to do a lot with marketing. They think that they just need to throw a lot at the wall and see what sticks. So we got to do a website. We've got to do a newsletter. We've got to do social media. We've got to do ads. We've got to do, I mean, you name, we've got to do video. You name it, we're doing it. We're doing infographics. Let's just do everything. And 
that's not always the best way to go. So I would recommend that you begin to calculate your return on effort. And what I mean by that is, so first review your marketing channels. Are you getting engagement? So what I mean by engagement is, are you getting any interaction at all with what you're doing in marketing? Are you getting re replies to an email that you send out? Are you getting signups to a newsletter? Are you getting replies or comments to a social post? Are you getting, re are social posts being reshared? Is there any engagement at all? And where is that engagement taking place? You have to start to notice these things. Next, how much effort is going into each channel? So if you're spending a lot of time creating a beautiful newsletter and your open rate is 5% or, or something really low, you may want to stop spending a lot of time creating a beautiful newsletter because it's just not impacting people. No one's, no one's engaging with the content. So the return on effort, this is my little formula, return on effort equals your current effort times the average level of engagement that you're getting for that piece of content. And that way you know what's actually working for you and what's not. And my recommendation is that you just shut down any channels or any things that are underperforming. Because if it's not working, why would you want to spend your time doing it anymore anyway? So I, I think my hunch is that most organizations, when they look at their marketing, could probably cut in half some of the things that they're doing just based on doing this little process and taking an, an honest look at what you're actively doing. Uh, next, I'd recommend streamlining processes. I'm a big process person. I find that it's really helpful to, to sort of wrap your mind around a, a specific process and then use that to be able to multiply what you're doing over and over and over again and drive things forward more quickly. And so I, I like to create templates and systems to speed up and standardize marketing. So here's what I mean by that. So email templates, use a standard email template that you can lightly customize for each campaign. Um, and standardize your process for documenting and sending automated emails. And even, you can even take that to the next level and do that for your personal emails. I do it all the time. When I'm responding to people, I will often have like a pre-written email that I will, I'll, I'll go, like I'll, I'll copy in and then just, you know, paste in a name, add in a few details and go from there and I can get through my email inbox faster. But in particular, when it comes to like MailChimp or, or whatever email platform you're using, you should have just a couple of templates. Is there a plain text template, a template with a really simple image at the top and maybe a call to action button at the bottom with a little bit of text in the middle, but have a few templates that you can just start with. You can craft the email really quickly. You can send it out for someone to review and proofread. Always have somebody proofread. I'm the worst grammar person. Is that a thing? In the world, I always have somebody proofread because I will always miss something, misspell something. I don't even know. Um, so have some templates for that. Next, social post templates and a process and a schedule. So you can begin to templatize how you're going to do social media. So for example, you could say, okay, once a month, I want to write a blog post and that blog post is going to be 800 words. And it's going to be about the, the key things that my nonprofit does for you know, our audience. So that's, that's, a, that's a piece of content, right? That's a, that's a first step in a process. And then from that, that one post, I want to be able to create uh, four graphics with quotes from that post that I can pull out and say, you know, it'll be an interesting thing to share on social. And then I can link back to that original piece of content. And then from that, I also want to record maybe audibly or, or video. I want to record for, for other things as well. And then you can share that video. And then I want to be able to create an infographic, for example, um, about it. So you can begin to have one piece of content and you can set up a process and a plan to make that one 800 word blog post into probably, I don't know, five to 15 pieces of content that you then share out over the next several weeks or month. And it gives you a lot of good information to send to people and to get them engaged, right? Uh, next, website updates and content. So how often is your website going to be updated? That's, a, that's an important question. You need to make sure there's not old events on there. You got to make sure there's not outdated information on there. Who's responsible for those updates? So you need to make sure you identify the person that's going to be able to do that on a regular basis in a timely manner, which is not always easy to do. And then what kind of content should be created and posted and by whom and how often? So again, thinking through a process, like what does that content look like? Do you have a volunteer that would really enjoy writing for you? And you can leverage that volunteer to write articles that then post on your website that then turn into 15 social posts. You get the idea, right? You can create a process, you can streamline that process, and you might even be able to find volunteers along the way that are willing to help you 
because if you have a very quantifiable, a very regimented process that someone can wrap their mind around, they can pretty easily say, oh, I can do that one time a month or, oh, I can do that three times a month or, oh, you know, I can host that, that webinar for you, um, that, that kind of thing. It gives people an, a good opportunity to serve and, and it, it's a, a finite opportunity. Next, oh, nope, there you go. All right, next, quality first. So, all right, th if you don't hear anything else I say, if you ignore everything, which is fine, hear the next thing that I say. On social, give more than you get. I see a lot of nonprofits that are on social that, that mean well, and they are constantly asking. They're asking, they're asking, sign up for this, do this, give us this donation, look at what we've done, look at what we've done, look at us, look at this program, look at this effect. And those things are great because showcasing the great work that you've done in the world is great, but only if you're giving more than you're getting. So you need to make sure that 80% of your posts are giving something of value to your followers. And here's what I mean by that. If people are following you, let's say, I don't know, let's say you're uh, an animal shelter and people follow you on social because they love animals, right? It's pretty clear. They're following you. You're posting cute pictures of, you know, dogs and kittens and things like that. What are you posting that adds value to them rather than asking them for things? So post, a, post that cute photo of the puppy that makes them smile for a few minutes. Post some funny videos. There was a, a video that was done during COVID-19 of some puppies playing in the Georgia Aquarium. And I live in Atlanta. And so I saw that, it went viral, it was great. There's these little puppies and they're running around looking at fish. It was fantastic, right? So, but if you're an animal shelter, that's a great thing to post because it, it brings a smile to people, it gives them value. So make sure that 80% of your posts give value of some kind to your, to your users, to your followers. And then 20% are asks, things that can benefit you, okay? What is your best content? Looking at everything you've ever done, from a marketing perspective, what is your best comment? What has gotten the most enthusiasm from your users? What has the most views? What has the most downloads? What has the most reads? And then what can you do to both showcase that content more? So amplify that content. And what can you do to create more content that's similar to it? Can you create other videos that are similar? Can you write other blog posts that are similar or on similar topics? Um, but a lot of times we have this great content that we've written years and years ago that's performed really well. And now we're out trying to write something totally different and create something totally different. But instead we can create derivatives of existing content that's already amazing. And it'll do really well because we know people already like it. Next, collaborate with others. This is a great opportunity. You can partner with others to create content that helps you both. That's what we're doing right now. I have a webinar, I have this talk that I created and I'm getting to give it to you and it's a benefit for, uh, for everybody, right? It's a benefit for me. Hopefully you'll connect with me on LinkedIn or somewhere else and we can stay connected. But create, find other people that are passionate about your subject matter, that are passionate about your users and your uh, followers and collaborate with them. See what you can do. Create videos, create webinars together, create podcasts together. And then repurpose great content. Again, back to your best content. Find it, repackage it, repurpose it, send it out into the world. If you've got a white paper that's amazing, then maybe you should turn that white paper into a podcast and talk all about that same subject and read portions of the white paper and then send it out. But whatever it is, find your great content and repurpose it. And the next, streamline your tools. Uh, this is a big one because, you know, a lot of times we get very distracted with a lot of tools. We really want to use a lot of tools. I'm a marketer. I love new tools. Tools are fun. It's fun to play around with them and figure out how they work and figure out how they can make me better. The problem is that I get a little lost in them sometimes and that really doesn't benefit anybody. And so you've got to streamline your tools. So what are the, what are the few tools that you're going to use to effectively market your nonprofit? Uh, the first thing I would say is a website CMS. Uh, that's a content management system. It gives you the ability to update the website on your own. That's critical. You've got to be able to have access to your own website. You don't want to have, you know, a volunteer or a company that, that is the only people that have access to your website because then you are at their mercy and you need to be able to make updates real time sometimes on your website. So I'm a big WordPress fan. The websites that we build at 48 and 48 are built on WordPress so that the nonprofits that we turn them over to can edit the websites all by themselves. There are other great CMSs out there as well. 
Um, but I I'd strongly recommend that you have a good website CMS that you can go to. Uh, the next thing is a good CRM, uh, also known as a client relationship management tool. Um, and this is a system that helps you manage and communicate and manage relationships, right? It's, it's, I, I like to think of a CRM as a single source of truth um, for your relationship with somebody. And what it allows you to do is if I have a, a conversation with, let's say I have a conversation with one of our board members, I'm, I'm new at TechBridge and maybe a board member wants to have a chat with me. So hopefully before I have that conversation, I can log into our CRM, I can look up the board member, and I can read maybe a little background on the board member. Okay, the board member has, you know, two kids and the board member has been involved with TechBridge for five years and is passionate about this. Um, and then maybe I can even see some recent conversations that have been logged into there, or some recent emails that have been logged into there. So I kind of understand contextually what's going on with that relationship so that when I walk into that meeting, I'm not just completely dumbfounded or blind to what's going on. And I can be more, speak more intelligently to the relationship that TechBridge then has with that person, with that board member. So that's really important. You've got to make sure you've got a great tool there uh, to use. I think uh, you may already be aware of a great tool for that. So that's pretty great. And social posting. So there's a few social posting tools that you can use to schedule posts. Um, you know, Hootsuite is a great tool. There's also Buffer that's a great tool. Um, the reality here is really just use whatever you're comfortable with to post on social. And then in addition, make sure you block out times during the day or the week to, to think about and post on social and schedule social posts. Because if you're trying to just kind of run social sort of on the fly and just sort of as you have time and as you think about it, you're just not going to do it well. You've got to have, uh, again, I mean, going back to, to this, you know, this process, you've got to have a process to schedule, to think about, to create, um, to post on social. You've got to think through what does that process look like? How often do we want to do it? Do we want to post once a day, once a week, once a month? What are our goals when we're posting? Are we just posting for no reason or are we posting because we want something to happen? Um, so think through those things together. And that's actually it because I like to leave a lot of time for Q&A. I do see uh, two questions here. I'm going to leave up my Let's Connect slide here. Um, I will mention I've got a personal website, adamjwalker.com. Would love for you to check it out. When you go there, you will see an, an email newsletter sign up pop up. I'd love for you to sign up for my newsletter. I send out a weekly newsletter about all the interesting articles that I've read that week, as well as some of the content that I personally have created. So now to Q&A. Uh, how do you recommend quantifying the average level of engagement? So Rachel, that's a great question. Um, and I would say that I, I don't know that there ever really is going to be an average level of engagement in particular. Um, I mean, not, not universally, right? So it's going to really entirely depend on your organization. So for example, if you regularly post Facebook posts and you never get any comments on your Facebook posts, just zero comments, and then you post something and you get two comments, that is significant. Now, we look at our personal profiles and we go, oh, two comments, that's nothing, right? Two comments is, is like a, it's, it's a rounding error, essentially. But that's, but that's really not true. That means that two people that have never chosen to engage with you before have now chosen to engage with you. And so you have to ask yourself, what content did you post that was so compelling that had them do that, right? So I think that's really important. Um, and, and then you can begin to understand what's the baseline of your engagement from that interaction, right? Um, another question from Rachel, she, she says, I work for a large nonprofit. However, our region area, let's see, our region area is basically operating on its own. So we don't have a go-to newsletter platform as we use, uh, platform we use for things at our office, such as MailChimp. I'm responsible for all fundraising events and all social media outreach for several counties, including and specifically a medium-sized city uh, in Indiana. Do you recommend an easy, free, cheap way to send out newsletters? Um, so, you know, that's an interesting question. There are a lot of platforms that are emerging right now that are really fascinating. So, um, so first of all, I mean, obviously, MailChimp always has the freemium model. Um, so it tends to be low cost. It tends to be pretty easy to use. I think it's free up to 2,000 subscribers. So that's helpful. However, that said, there are a lot of really interesting MailChimp competitors out there that are probably worth looking into. Um, I do not have personal experience with very many of them at this moment. There are a few here and there that I've dabbled with and they've all been, been fine. Um, but overall, I, I think you just kind of have to research and see what's going to work best for you. 
Let's see, another question. I feel like engagement on social media for our nonprofit has actually gone down since the pandemic has started. Is anyone else noticing this? So that's a really interesting question. Um, and and I, can, I can share a little bit of anecdotal information about that. So um, it's a great example for me. I'm, I've been a huge podcast listener and a huge audiobook listener forever and ever and ever and would listen to about a, one audiobook a week and I mean, a handful of podcasts just all the time. And since the pandemic started, I've basically eliminated that entirely because I'm not driving. And so that was my main time for doing that. Um, I, would, I would guess that a lot of people's lives are, are upended in ways that have uh, really messed up their normal routines. And so their normal sort of social media routines are messed up. Um, their normal, like, you know, when they would normally just sit down and veg out and check social media, they're probably doing something else right now. So my hunch is that, um, yes, it's probably disrupted for most people across the board, though I don't have any quantifiable evidence to back that up. So, oh, good. Somebody asked uh, about podcasts. This will be fun. I love podcasts. All right. As someone who does podcasts, how advantageous do you think it is for nonprofits to jump into, mar into this marketing realm as soon as driving in a car picks back up? Ooh, that's a fun question. So, and that's actually an entire webinar that I give um, that I don't have time to give right now, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the highlights. So podcasting is interesting. <clears throat> Pardon me. Podcasting is interesting depending on how you want to think about it. Um, so a lot of people think about podcasting and they think, oh, we want to build an audience. So that's the only goal of the podcast. And I would say that's probably the wrong goal. So I think there's two other goals for a nonprofit that are interesting. One goal is connecting with a very, very, very niche focused audience. So uh, to, to my podcast example, Tech Talk Y'all, we talk about technology news. We're kind of nerdy. We talk about nerdy stuff. We talk about nerdy news. We laugh while we do it. It's a very, very focused audience. It's not going to be sort of a good general audience that's going to really appreciate that particular podcast, right? So that's, that's one opportunity. If you're audience for your nonprofit is a very niche, very unique, very interesting audience. A podcast is a really great way to connect with them at a very, very, very deep level. The second thing is it, that's interesting is that podcast interviews open doors to relationships that you otherwise would not be able to walk through. So uh, what I mean by that is you, I, I've, I've done podcasts that I actually used as a sales lead generation tool. Um, as a matter of fact, it's how I ended up getting uh, Susan G. Komen's national office as a client. And so I had a podcast. It was a nonprofit marketing podcast. And I would reach out to the lead, not the lead marketer at large nonprofits and ask them to be on my podcast, to be an, a guest on my podcast. And they would say yes all the time. I got to meet the head of marketing for Susan G. Komen, the head of marketing for March of Dimes, the head of marketing for ACLU. People that absolutely have no business answering my email or phone call were happy to talk to me because I was interviewing them on my podcast. And so you can use a podcast to open doors that you otherwise would not be able to open and make connections that you otherwise would not be able to make. Um, to me, that's actually my favorite use of a podcast. So if you can make it fun and interesting and about a topic that you love, and you can make it a means by which to open doors and network and meet new people, that's kind of a pretty huge win. So that's, uh, that's my take on that. All right, I've got a question from Judy. We have four distinct stakeholder groups that, are trying, that we are trying to reach, the high school students that we offer the programming to, their parents, teachers, and other school staff, and business industry, industry folks. What advice do you have to effectively reach each group when resources are limited? So, Judy, you've, you've hit on kind of the, the, the crux of nonprofit marketing that's a problem because nonprofits inherently have the problem of they've got very, very, very diverse audiences. They have the audience they serve, which is often completely and totally separated from the audience that funds them, which is often the, the business community or something like that. Um, and then, which is often completely removed from their volunteers. Um, so a lot of times the people that give money are not the people that will volunteer are not the people that the nonprofit would then serve. And so you have to really figure out, number one, what content and what messaging is applicable to all of them? Because to some degree, there is some crossover, right? If I'm a, if, if you're a nonprofit that, uh, that helps high school students, I have a high school student 
So by default, there's some crossover in, in the interest of, in the content that would be interesting to both me and my student, right? And to the teachers potentially. Um, so I think you can look at it that way. Um, the other thing you have to look at is, is really which audience, focusing on which audience is going to help you grow the fastest. Because the reality is long-term as you grow, you can focus on more audiences. Short-term in order to grow, you probably need to focus on one or two. And so you're going to have to decide what audience. So, so answer this question. If this audience was to grow dramatically, that would help our nonprofit grow the most. And that's the audience that you really have to focus on first and really make sure that you're spending a lot of time on. And then the other audiences you begin to support from there. It's very difficult. Nonprofit marketing is so much harder than a lot of regular marketing for that very reason, because there are so many different audiences that you have to, to deal with. But uh, you're at least asking the right question. Uh, I got another question from Justin. How important do you think Twitter is for a nonprofit to be a part of? With our nonprofit, we see high engagement through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. But with Twitter, we are still trying to figure out what the point is for us. I think that's a lot of nonprofits, um, to be honest, Justin. So full confession, um, I don't engage well on Twitter. I, you know, I, 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 I kind of lurk on there a bit and we'll read stuff. And I'll kind of push out stuff a little bit, but I don't, I don't do a good job of engaging in conversation. And that's really what matters on Twitter. So, and, and honestly, that's going to be true for all of them is, is you've got to be ready to engage in the community dialogue that is happening. Uh, that's true on Facebook. It's true on Instagram. It's true on Twitter. And it's going to be different for every single platform. And so if you want to do good on Twitter, I mean, you know, look at trending hashtags on a regular basis and make sure you're following those trending hashtags and make sure you're commenting and, and communicating uh, with those hashtags to be picked up by other people. Um, again, you know, go back to that 80-20 rule, 80% value, 20% promotion. A lot of what's on Twitter is, is promotion, promotion, promotion in particular. And that really drives me crazy. And I unfollow those people really quickly. You've got to provide a lot of value, sharing articles, sharing interest, interesting things on Twitter. That's a really, really huge upside and a huge opportunity. Um, but again, I mean, it just goes back to engagement and it goes back to communication. It goes back to uh, community, like being a part of the community. You've just got to be willing to be a part of that community. Let's see. Oh, no more questions for right now. Anybody else have a question? We've got a couple questions in the chat, Adam, actually. Great. Oh, uh, let me pull that up. Or do you want to read it to me? What's better? I can read it to you if you'd like. Sure, go for it. We had a couple of questions come in before the webinar as well through our email, so I can field one of those first. Um, should we be updating old blog content that isn't relevant now due to COVID-19 or should we leave it alone? Wow, that's a really good question. So I think that I've, I've got two questions to that. Um, if it will forever be irrelevant and it's not drawing in a lot of traffic, I would just remove it completely. Now, if it happens to be a resource that's drawing in a lot of traffic for some reason, then it's probably worth um, like doing like a little update at the top to correct the information um, so that somebody doesn't get confused and then making sure that traffic continues to come into your website. Great, thank you. The next one is from Brennan. Um, Thanks for a great talk. How many social posts is too many posts? We post daily, sometimes multiple times, a lot of inform information and article sharing, few asks for support. Uh, we have moderate engagement on each. Is there a benchmark standard? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I, I think, I, I honestly think multiple times a day is fine because the reality is that users are so in and out of social platforms that even if you post multiple times a day, the reality is that probably only a very small percentage of your followers will even see one of the posts, much less two. So I don't think you're going to harm yourself by posting. Really, the question comes to quality. If you are posting multiple times a day, you've just got to make sure that whatever you're posting is high quality. Um, that's going to be what's going to get engagement. That's what's going to drive people. That's what's going to, you know, make them want to continue to engage with you. Um, so I think, I think it's fine to post multiple times a day. In fact, I'm working on a plan um, to be posting a uh, minimum of once a day for 100 days for uh, TechBridge and creating a lot of content. Um, and I'm excited about that. But man, it's a daunting task. Thank you for answering that. We've got another question from Rebecca. Um, any tips or best practices on how to incorporate funding, sponsors, or partners for a national organization that has local chapters? Wow, um, that's tricky. Um, so uh, part of it's gonna be based on the contract for, for one thing. Um, 
you know, it, and it's also going to depend on how your local chapters are built out. If they each have their own individual uh, like Facebook page, or if it's all coming from a national page, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be dependent on that. I think it's always good to include sponsors as much as humanly possible anyway, just to make sure that they really feel loved and promoted, especially as things go virtual. I mean, we're all probably taking events that were once physical into the virtual space, and we need to make sure that the sponsors don't feel like they're getting uh, less for their money than we can actually give to them. And I, and I would actually argue too that in the virtual world, we can actually give them more for their money because we can control the eyeballs that see their logo and see what they're doing um, if we're thoughtful about it. Awesome. We've got another question from Justin as well. Um, we just started using Google search engine marketing for the first time last winter and saw a good return from it. Are there any search engine marketing good practice techniques you can provide us with? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, I, I assume you probably are talking about Google Grants. Um, if you are a nonprofit and you have not heard the word Google Grants, I would encourage you to search Google Grants. Uh, Google does have a grant for nonprofits that allows you uh, to basically have free advertising with Google AdWords up to $10,000 worth of advertising per month. Um, I will tell you the management of that is not always easy. Um, so you will have to, to put some effort in to learn it. But the reality is that you can drive a lot of traffic to your site if you were thoughtful with Google Grants. Um, so general best practices, um, number one, never, when you're doing any kind of paid advertising, never, ever, ever, ever send anyone to a general website page. Don't ever send them to your homepage. Don't ever send them to a general page. Always send them to a page that is specific to that ad. So if I'm going to create an ad that's about, you know, we'll go back to the, to the, uh, the pet uh, or the animal shelter example. If I'm an animal shelter, we're having a pet adoption day uh, next Saturday and I run an ad in Google Grants for a pet adoption day, they need to land on a page that is about that specific pet adoption day with that specific date and all that information. I should never send them anywhere else. I shouldn't send them to an events calendar or anything else. So that's my, that's my most important piece of advice is make sure that the process of them seeing the ad, going to the page, make sure it all matches up and they understand what they're doing and make sure on that page that you have a really solid, what's called a call to action, which is just simply a button or whatever that says, you know, donate now, sign up now, RSVP now, whatever it is. Thank you so much. We actually have a question that just came in to our emails. Um, I am looking for ideas to set up procedures in place to keep our website updated, yet not have our program staff send communication interns random requests in piecemeal. Um, we do not list our calendar of events on our website, but we have updates off and on and would like this uh, to be all incorporated. How would you handle this? Yes, I'm, I'm actually working on that uh, right now, as a matter of fact. And so what I've done and what I would recommend you do is create a submission uh, or a website uh, update request form. Um, I've used, so I've, I've done it even in the past where I've used Google Forms and tied that into Trello, where it auto creates a card in Trello. Right now, um, we're actually using uh, the Asana platform for project management, and so I can create a form there. But the bottom line is you need a standardized way to ask people to fill out a form to give you updates because what'll happen if you don't have a standardized way is they'll say, hey, I need, I need the website updated with this information and they won't give you the page. They won't tell you what the information is. They won't attach the photo um, and they'll just forget. They, it's an honest mistake. And then you got to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and it wastes a whole lot of time. But if you have a form, you know, that form can say, okay, what, paste in the URL of the page that we're updating. Now tell us why we're making this update. Now tell us what the update is. Now attach any files or, or any links that we need to know for this update and you can have it all in one nice uniform place and that way it makes it really easy for somebody to go in and update for you. That sounds like what we need as well. <laughs> 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 um, so we've had another question from Justin come in. Uh, is marketing through radio and newspaper and possibly television an antiquated way of marketing now and should we move away from those mediums? Ooh. Okay, so uh, I, I should preface my answer first by saying that I really don't have a lot of experience in those mediums. Um, so I have opinions, but they're not opinions necessarily backed up by data. So let me just start there. Uh, I would say the problem with those mediums is that it's very difficult to track their effectiveness as compared to digital marketing. With digital marketing, you can know if I spend $2.00 it's going to result in this and you can track all the way through to see that result. When you're running a radio ad, it's much, much, much harder to do that. But that said, uh, there is value in your name being out there. There's value in people seeing your logo. There's, there's value in sort of these broad campaigns. That's why people still pay for this marketing. I mean, there's a 
reason that, you know, Coca-Cola still has commercials. Um, so I, I, I would never say there's not value in it. I just think from a nonprofit perspective, you can track your money better. You can see where it goes. You can likely spend less money in the digital spaces than in the traditional spaces. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from the chat. Uh, should we be posting about COVID or continuing to weave that into our nonprofit narrative? How much is too much? Uh, we're having a hard time figuring out how to tailor our message to meet our donors during the pandemic. Yeah, I guess my, my question is, how much do you want to hear about it? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want to hear about it much these days, right? You know, I, when, it, when the whole first thing started, you're, I was reading a million articles and I'm listening to podcasts daily about it. And then it was information overload. And then I, I, I just stopped all of it, just 100% none of it. And now I listen, I mean, very, very little, right? And so I think you just have to ask yourself, like, how much do you want to hear that? And then put yourself in the shoes of your users um, and do that. I, I think the reality is most of us probably are more interested in other things. You know, um, what are you doing that's interesting during this time? Um, what are you doing that, that's going to sort of uh, brighten our day? You know, like put a smile on our face, those sorts of things, rather than more COVID type information. Unless, unless it's specifically uh, pertinent to like what your organization does, right? Great. Um, I think those are all of our questions, unless anyone else had anything they wanted to say last minute. Well, if nobody has anything else, I would love to stay connected. Please check out my website so, or my podcast. That's great too. They're fun. All right. Well then, thank you so much. Um, I, that concludes our session for today. Um, so before we sign off here, I just want to remind you that our next session will be on Tuesday, May 26th at 8.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. EST. This session will be led by the Common Good Fundraising's David Kravinchuk, where he'll be presenting his session titled Boost Donor Loyalty and Revenue with Simple Stewardship Strategies. If you haven't already registered for that, we've posted the link in the comment section to sign up. Um, so lastly, I just want to remind everyone that this session today was recorded, so you'll be receiving the recording along with Adam's slide deck and some resources by the end of the week. Um, thank you again, everyone, and see you next week.